And the lesson for God's Word today and the lesson for our sermon is from the, the very last book of the Bible, from Revelation chapter 6. Here, Jesus' disciple John gets to see into heaven, and here's one of the things that John sees in heaven. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. This is God's word. Dear friends of Jesus, how long? There's been 34 families in the state of Florida asking that question for a long time. February 14th, 2018, a shooter attacked Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. 17 people were killed. 17 more people were injured. So there's been 34 families who've been saying, how long? How long until justice is served? How long until the guilty one is punished? And I've had to wait a long time. It's been four and a half years. Finally, just a couple weeks ago on November 2nd, the sentence for that killer was announced. He's supposed to serve 17 consecutive life sentences. Justice, right? Except when those families of the victims were interviewed after that sentence, a lot of them said, that doesn't seem long enough. That doesn't seem harsh enough for what he did, taking 17 lives, affecting 17 others. Even after the sentencing, they said, how long? How long until justice is really served? Have you asked that question in your life? How long? It's been a question that's been on the minds of God's people throughout the ages. Do you know whom Jesus called the greatest person ever born? Somebody should know that. John the Baptist. Jesus says no one was born of a woman who was greater than John the Baptist. He's the Elijah that our first lesson prophesied. Elijah's going to come before the end. That was John the Baptist. Do you know how John the Baptist's life ended up? When he was in his early 30s, he was beheaded and his head was carried around on a platter at a party. He said, how long? How long until justice is served? Can you list off the three most famous of Jesus' 12 disciples? What three do we always list together? Peter, James, and John, right? Peter, James, and John. We hear that Peter and John went on to live long lives. They had long ministries. Do you know what happened to James? James was beheaded almost right away after Jesus ascended into heaven. You don't hear about him doing anything. Just getting killed. You say, how long? How long until God makes that right? Not just in, in Bible times. This idea of martyrs. A martyr is someone who dies for their faith. The Christian church is full of of martyrs. You ever heard of Ignatius of Antioch? You know, we don't pay attention to people who lived in the past very much, right? Ignatius of Antioch was one of John, Jesus' disciples, John's disciples. The disciple of the disciple John. Ignatius was dragged to Rome and he was thrown into an arena with wild beasts and he was torn to pieces while the whole arena cheered. You say, how can that happen? You heard of a, a man named Polycarp? Polycarp was another disciple of Jesus' disciple John. People think he might be the, the last living person who knew one of Jesus' disciples in 155 AD. He was taken to Rome too and he was burned at the stake. Get in front of a whole audience of people in the stadium. You say, how long? When is justice finally going to be served? 
And that didn't stop 2,000 years ago. Have you, have you heard the names Jan von Essen or Henrik Voss? I didn't expect you to know those. Those two men are the, the first two Lutheran martyrs. You say, Lutheran martyrs? It's a thing? Yeah, absolutely. In 1523, those two men, Jan van Essen and Henrik Voss, were burned at the stake in Brussels, Belgium, because they refused to recant, to take back their belief that we're saved by faith in Jesus alone. So they're burned at the stake. You say, how long? How long is God gonna put up with that? When's there gonna be justice? Maybe you think, well, it's good that we don't deal with that anymore, right? Did you know that historians believe that in the 20th century, the 1900s, more Christians were killed for their faith than in the previous 19 centuries combined? You ever heard that before? Do you know how many Christians, historians guess, were martyred, were put to death for their faith in the 1900s? 26 million. 26 million. Places like Soviet Union and Turkey and Uganda and China. People today like to say, well, if you believe in Jesus, you can expect to be healthy and wealthy, right? Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Was Jesus right? He said, how long? How long? When is, when is there going to be justice? Even for people from Oklahoma. Have you heard that in Oklahoma City right now, they are building the largest Catholic church in the state of Oklahoma? You heard about this? It's right along I-35 South as you're going through Oklahoma City. It's built in honor of a man from Oklahoma named Stanley Rother. You ever heard of Stanley Rother? He was born, I think it was 1935 in Okarchi, Oklahoma. It was just a tiny town west of Oklahoma City somewhere. When he grew up, he became a Catholic priest. He served here in Oklahoma for five years and then he decided to be a missionary in Guatemala. And so he went to Guatemala and he served in Guatemala for 13 years. And in July 1981, three people broke into his church in the middle of the night and assassinated him. Not just a random act, but because he was a Christian missionary. And none of those three were ever arrested. There's no trial, no penalty. He said, how long? How long is God going to let that go on? How long until there's justice? You ever said those words yourself? How long? I bet you have. I bet you have over and over again in your life. How long, oh Lord? How long will I have to suffer? How long will life seem so unfair? How long will wicked people be so successful? How long will your church be trampled and ignored? How long? It's been the cry of God's people for millennia, thousands of years. How long? Here's something surprising. That question, how long, isn't just what God's people here on earth ask. It's actually also what God's people in heaven are asking. It said that Jesus let his disciple John look into heaven and of the many things that he sees in the book of Revelation, one of the things he saw was this. He said, I saw beneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. John saw into heaven, he saw this great altar in the presence of God, and underneath the altar he saw souls of people. And not just souls of any people, he saw the souls of people who had been slain for the word of God, people who had been violently slaughtered for believing in Jesus, maybe people like John the Baptist, or like James the Apostle. Does that scene surprise you? It actually fits perfectly with everything the Bible says. According to the Bible, the moment that you die, what happens to your soul? What immediately goes either, either to heaven or to hell based on whether you have faith in Jesus. There's no purgatory, there's no middle place. The moment that you die, your, your soul goes to heaven. And so when those martyrs, when they were put to death for their faith, the moment that they died, where their, where their soul go? To heaven. Makes sense, right? John looks into heaven and he sees souls. 
But there's something surprising about the picture. What's surprising is that these souls in heaven, these martyred Christians are, are still praying. <coughs> Sometimes we get it in our minds that, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to think about like unicorns and lollipops and butterflies, right? It's not the picture the Bible presents. These souls in heaven are praying to God. They're not just praying, they're actually crying out to God. They're calling out, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. I don't misunderstand. The, the book of Revelation also has beautiful pictures of the souls in heaven praising Jesus. It's got beautiful pictures of how in heaven there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain. That in heaven God's going to wipe all of our tears away from our eyes. That's all absolutely true. And yet, the Bible does tell us that even those people in heaven, they still have one question. And what is it? How long? How long, Sovereign Lord? Until you judge the world? Until you make it right? Do you realize this? That when you get to heaven, you'll actually be more concerned about justice than you are here on earth. Do you know why? Because you'll be perfect. Everything here on earth is still plagued by our sins. Do we want there to be justice on earth? Sometimes. Do you want police officers to pull over everyone who speaks? Kind of. Right? Unless it's me. As long as it's not me. Right? Do you want the IRS to crack down and make sure everybody pays every single cent that they owe? A little bit. Right? Oh, for those people... But not for me. Isn't that how justice works in this world? People today seem so concerned about justice and it's always mixed in with some hypocrisy, right? I want people to be judged for the wrong things that they do as long as it doesn't impact me. Do you realize that when you get to heaven, you're going to be even more concerned about justice than you are here on earth? Because you're going to be like God. Do you know what God's like? The saints in heaven tell us, they tell us that God is holy and true. God is perfectly holy. God is perfectly just. If you and I, sinful people, get bothered by sins here on earth, how, how serious do you think sin is to the perfect and holy God of heaven? God is going to judge sin. He's going to judge sin. Every sin. There's a day for that. It's called Judgment Day. There's a place for that. It's called hell. If ever you're concerned that maybe sin won't be fully punished the way that it deserves, you don't have to be concerned. Not when you see what hell is like. Not when you hear about Judgment Day. If you're concerned about justice, we need Judgment Day. How long, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge their blood. How long? Before we hear God's answer, note this one thing. It's not our job as Christians in this world to carry out justice against other people. Do you realize that? There's a story in the Bible where a Christian tried to. It was Peter. Remember the night when Jesus got arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane? Peter pulled out his sword and he cut off the ear of one of the people arresting Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus said to Peter? He said, put your sword back in its place. Whoever draws the sword will die by the sword. It's not our job as Christians to carry out justice against people here on earth. Whose job is it? It's God's job. It's God's job. Way back in the Old Testament, God says it is Mine to avenge. I will repay. Justice is God's job. And so we say to God, how long? When's it going to happen? Here's the first thing. We're told that each of those souls in heaven was given a white robe. Maybe you hear that and you say, really? Clothes? That's God's answer. Just do you know what a white robe in the Bible signifies? In the next chapter of Revelation, John actually asks somebody in heaven, what are these white robes that everybody's wearing? And the person in heaven says, these are they who've come out of the great tribulation. 
They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So if you're given a white robe in heaven, what does that mean? It means you're saved. It means you are forgiven of all of your sins in Jesus' blood. And now just imagine, these souls in heaven, they're the martyrs. They're people who are rejected. They're people who are slaughtered. They're people who are mocked during their lives on earth. But when they got to heaven, what did they receive? Forgiveness. Life. Salvation treasured by God. They were given this white robe. Because we haven't actually talked about the greatest martyr yet. We listed off quite a few. Do you know who the greatest martyr is? It's not John the Baptist or even James. It's Jesus. Jesus himself allowed himself to be crucified on the cross, to be executed, right? For his faith in God. It, of course, for Jesus, there was even more involved He was dying for us, for our sins. He was suffering God's punishment for our sins, to save us, to forgive us. So for everyone who believes in Jesus, there's this white robe of God's forgiveness. On Veterans Day, this this past Friday, I saw something on TV where a little schoolgirl asked an old veteran, just an, an old man with a cane, she said to him, would you do it all again? And this old veteran, he he leaned in close to the little girl and he said, I would for you. Isn't that what Jesus says to every one of us? I want comfort. Jesus, he said, I'd do it again. For you, no matter what you face on earth, there's a white robe of Jesus' righteousness around your shoulders by God's grace. Saints in heaven asking how long they were given white robes And then they were told to wait a little longer. Just a little longer. What do they need to wait for? Judgment day. God is really going to judge the world. Do you realize that? God is really going to judge the world. He is going to judge every sin from every wicked thought in our minds to the most violent murders. Every single sin is going to be held accountable by God. God tells us there's only two solutions to sin. Either you you trust in Jesus' forgiveness that he won for us at the cross, or you'll pay for your own sins in hell. That's how God talks about justice. Either you believe in, in Jesus' forgiveness won for you at the cross, or you'll pay for your own sins in hell. When you see school shootings, mass violence, cruel people, you can know this. God will judge. When? Just wait a little longer. Just a little longer. Until the full number of their fellow servants, our brothers and sisters, were killed just like they were. Those saints in heaven need to wait until more Christians can be killed like they were. It doesn't sound very comforting, does it? But it is, because it means this. Even when Christians are persecuted, who is still absolutely in control? Jesus is. He even knows the exact number of Christians who are going to put, be put to death by, for their faith. Jesus knows. and Jesus wants a, a few more Christians to be able to die for their faith, just like he did. No, that sounds kind of upside down, but have you heard the, the famous statement that goes like this? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Ever heard that before? It goes way back to the early Christian church. As as more and more Christians were put to death for their faith, do you know what happened to the Christian church? It grew. Because as people saw Christians being willing to face death and not deny their faith in Jesus, when the world saw Christians being willing to face wild animals and beheading and burning at the stake, and still looking forward to the joy that waits for us in heaven. Do you know what that did to all those other people? It made them want to find out about this Jesus guy. The worst that the world can do to God's church is put Christians to death. And God uses the death of Christians to point other people to Christ. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. God says, judgment day hasn't come yet. Because a few more Christians need to die for their faith. Maybe you. 
Maybe me. Did you see how all of this sets the right perspective in our minds as we think about the future of the world? There's two perspectives that Christians take when it comes to what's going to happen the rest of, of, of the time on earth. They're sometimes called the theology of glory and the theology of the cross. We've talked about these two uh, quite a bit this fall. Do you remember what they stand for? If someone follows the theology of glory, they say, if you believe in Jesus, things are going to go great. You're going to have health and wealth and prosperity and success here on earth. If you just believe in Jesus, you're going to get glory. If you don't have glory in your life right now, you know what the problem is? You must not believe hard enough. That's a theology of glory. The theology of the cross says if you believe in Jesus, you should expect to receive what Jesus received. What did Jesus receive? The cross. Follow the theology of the cross. It means that here in life, like Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. First comes the cross, and then comes the glory for us in heaven. Which of those two philosophies, the theology of glory or the theology of the cross, better describes the world that we see around us? It's the theology of the cross. For believers in Jesus, first at the cross, then in heaven, it's, it's the glory. That means that as Christians, our lives are always a now and a not yet at the same time. It's always now and not yet at the same time. Are you forgiven? Yes. When? Right now. Right now, all of your sins have been washed away in baptism and at Jesus' cross. But, do you always feel perfectly forgiven? Do you see sin done away with in our world? Not yet. Not until Judgment Day. It's always now. And not yet. As a Christian, our... Are you loved by God? Yes. When? Right now. You are more loved than you can possibly imagine. And yet, do you always feel perfectly loved? Not yet. Not until when? Until you get to heaven. To be with Jesus. This is how the Bible describes our life as Christians. It's always now and not yet. Now and not yet, forgiven, love the children of God, and yet waiting for that day when we see God reign perfectly, when we see God's justice carried out perfectly, when we experience salvation perfectly. Being a Christian is now and not yet at the same time. And so what do we find ourselves saying? How long? How long? Just realize you're going to ask that question the rest of your life. And you know what? When you get to heaven, you might still be asking that question. How long? Just remember God's answer. First, trust in Jesus' salvation. You were baptized. Jesus draped around your shoulders the white robe of his righteousness. You are absolutely perfect in God's eyes. No one can take that away from you. No persecution you might suffer. Even to the point of death, no one can take away the salvation that Jesus has won for you. Trust in Jesus' salvation. Then, wait a little longer. Makes me think of that verse in the Bible that says, Be still and know that I am God. You memorized that one yet? Be still and know that I am God. Can you say that with me? Be still and know that I am God. Trust in Jesus' salvation and then, wait a little longer. Finally, let your light shine. The reason that Judgment Day hasn't come yet is because God wants there to be more Christians. God wants more people to believe in Jesus. God wants more Christians to be put to death for their faith in Him. Let your light shine. To God's glory. How long? Just a little longer. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, as we look at our lives and we look at the world, we say what your people have said to you for thousands of years. How long? Life can seem so unfair. Our lives can seem so unfair. It can seem like the wrong side wins, like the wrong people are praised, like the wrong people are punished. 
And you give us this promise at the end of the Bible in Revelation that you are perfectly in control. You remind us about Jesus' salvation won for us at the cross. And we never forget the white robes you've given us. You encourage your people to be patient, knowing that all things are working according to your timetable, to your glory. And you tell Christians to let our lights shine, even to the point of death, so that more people can see you and come to faith in your salvation. Dear Lord Jesus, give us the patience as we wait for you to make all things right. In your name we pray. Amen.